Hey, welcome to another exciting episode of Reading PowerPoints Out. Now, thank you very much for those of you who have been with us since this start. It's been an emotional journey, and my true fans, I know who you are. Yeah, I don't know. So, we're looking at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. This can sometimes be shortened down to the EM spectrum. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be looking at the properties of the waves, the uses of the waves, the dangers of the waves, and also how the waves act when we play around with them. So... First off, we need to know about refraction. Now, a couple of key words that we need to go into here now. Refraction is the bending of light. The boundary just talks about the, the parts of uh, space, the part of an environment where one type of medium changes into another type of medium. So it could be, for example, air or glass. Sorry, every now and again, my mouse does this weird little line thing here, and I don't know what it is. I think it's trying to escape these lessons, but you can't escape with a line. You must stay with me. Transparent means you can see through. Reflected is when we have something bouncing off, so we can have a sound wave reflected from a wall. We call that an echo, or a reflection in a mirror. When a light wave bounces off, a mirror goes back into our eyes. Um, density is just uh, the idea about more particles in a particular amount of space. So if I had two blocks, block A and block B, mad drawing skills here, and block A and block B were the same volume. So they have the same volume, the same amount of space is taken up by both of these objects. But we say the mass of this one was one kilogram and the mass of this one was 10 kilograms. There's more stuff or there's heavier stuff or there's bigger particles in this thing than there is in this thing. So we say that this one is more dense. Now we'll talk about optical density in a little bit, and that's just about how hard it is for light to travel through a particular particle. Um, we'll talk about incidence um, and refraction in detail when I'm going through this little graph on the right-hand side. And I just want you to know substance just means thing. Now, substance can sometimes be called a medium. It's interchangeable. So, refraction of waves at a boundary, and using ray, ray, ray diagrams to see this. When light strikes a transparent material, some of the light may be reflected, but some will also be refracted. And we can see that down here in this, um, in this diagram. So, a ray of light is shown using a line. It should always include an arrow. <clears throat> and if it's something that's going into a new medium, so this is the medium of air, this is the medium of water, if it's something going in, to the new medium, we call it an incident ray. So my incident ray is going to hit this new medium at this point here that we call the boundary. When my incident ray interacts with the boundary, one of two things can happen. The one is reflection. Now, reflection is when the ray hits the boundary and goes off, and it's always a predictable angle. If we look at this line here, it divides the two angles. Angle A will equal angle A. That's not an A, that's a squiggle. There we go. If light is able to get into the boundary, if it's able to transmit, which means go through, then it will refract if they are different densities and if the ray is at an angle. When light enters a substance of greater density, it will be bent or refracted towards the normal line. What does the normal line mean? Well, if I had a ray of light that was shining at this boundary, at that angle, it would just travel all the way through. There would be no reflection and there would be no refraction. If this boundary was, well, if there was reflection, it would just go back in the way that it came. There would be no there would be no visible angles. But if it does go through, if it does transmit, which means go through, then there would be no bending. There would be no refraction. What does it mean by bend towards the normal line? Well, look at my incident ray. My incident ray, if it could just carry on doing its normal little thing without having to be moved in any other direction, it would carry on in that direction. If it was just going to go straight through, then this line would show the direction that it's going. However, the line that we get in reality is over here. The ray has moved towards this line. We call it normal because if it, if it just goes straight through, it acts normally when it goes 
at this angle. If it goes at 90 degrees to the boundary, it just goes through normally without any refraction. So if it goes from something of low density like air into something of high density like water, so if my incident ray transmits across a boundary from a medium of low density to a medium of high density, then the refracted ray refracts towards the normal line. That's how you'd say it in proper big posh terms. Simple, the ray going in, when it hits the side of the, the, uh, the edge of a boundary, if it's going from something less dense to something more dense, the refracted ray, the ray that's going through the material, goes towards the normal line. And if it was to go into something of lower density, the refracted ray will go away from the normal line. There's a couple of uh, terms here that we've got. We've got an angle of incidence <clears throat> and an angle of refraction. We always measure our angles from the ray to the normal. That little theta there stands for angle. That little symbol that we see here, theta incident, theta refracted, just refers to the angle. So if we want to measure the angle of incidence, we measure from the ray to the normal line. That is our, our angle of incidence. If we want to measure the angle of refraction, we measure from the ray to the normal line, and that will be my angle, my refracted ray. If something is going from low density to high density, then the angle of incidence will always be greater than the angle of refraction. If light is entering a substance or a medium of lower density from a medium of higher density, then the angle of incidence will be smaller than the angle of refraction, less than. Now here are some questions. Bibbidi bobbidi pause. Pause, answers. And I just know that everybody got 100%. And if not, here it is again. And again. And again. Better get 100%. Now, light is a type of electromagnetic wave. And what we're going to be looking at now is the different types of electromagnetic waves and what we mean by electromagnetic waves. Well, it's kind of in the name, sort of. Electromagnetic waves are waves that are made up of an electric field and a magnetic field. Did you hear about the magic tractor? It turned into a field. Another classic McKelvey joke. Electromagnetic waves are waves that are made up of an electric field and a magnetic field. They are transverse. And there's a bit of revision. Transverse waves oscillate perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer or wave travel. EM waves, because we can say that if we're super cool, instead of saying electromagnetic, we can say EM. EM waves transfer energy from the wave source to an absorber. An example might be the sun transmitting EM waves from the sun to a person. Jeepers, that person appears to be running away from the sun. Maybe the sun is an angry, evil sun. It's going to get you if you're not slow, or if you're not fast even. Now, electric wave, electromagnetic waves, EM waves, form a continuous spectrum. And a spectrum is this idea that you have two extremes. And then in between those extremes, you've got this steady but slight difference from one extreme to another. EM waves form a continuous spectrum from the shortest wavelength of a gamma ray to radio waves with the longest wavelength. Gamma rays have got a wavelength of 1 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. So that's 0. 0.1234567891 1 meters of wavelength. Very, 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 very small wavelength. Radio waves can have wavelengths that are 100,000 meters long. 
So there are the two extremes. Every other electromagnetic wave is somewhere in between those two extremes. That's what the word spectrum means. Shorter wavelengths have a higher frequency and therefore higher energy. This is super important. This we'll be talking about again. If nothing else, remember that. In fact, you have to remember everything, but remember this most especially. And another, another example of something you have to remember is this. All electromagnetic waves travel at the same velocity in a vacuum. A reminder that velocity is speed in a particular direction, an unchanging direction. It's a vector quantity. And it's just really fun. All electromagnetic waves travel at 300,000 meters per second. This is rather quick. This is indeed faster than year seven trying to get to the front of the lunch queue. This little diagram down here gives us the uh, different electromagnetic waves that we might find. And it gives us pretty much all the information that we have to remember, apart from 300 million meters per second, all the information that we have to remember about the electromagnetic waves. We have to remember the order. We have to remember which ones are the shortest wavelength. We have to remember which ones are the longest wavelength, shortest frequency, and highest frequency. And if we remember that the higher frequency is higher energy, then we'll be absolutely sorted. Let's have a look. There's going to be a song, by the way, and everybody knows which song it is. There'll be a song linked in the comments section, and everybody should listen to it 50 times. Do, 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 do. So what is the electromagnetic spectrum made of? Radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. And I just know that everybody who knows sang that song in their head. 100% sure. Gamma rays have got the shortest wavelength, the highest frequency, and the highest energy. X-rays will have a longer wavelength, a lower frequency, and a lower energy. And we work all the way along the spectrum to get back up to radio waves that have the longest wavelength, the lowest frequency, and the lowest energy. Visible light is made up of Roy G. Bibb. We'll have another song starring Mr. Patrick. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Look at, you have to read it this direction to that direction. Roy G. Bibb. This is the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're able to see. But some animals can see an ultraviolet, like honeybees, and some can detect infrared, like nasty little snakes that should all be exterminated and no one should ever like. Sad face next to snakes. Blah. Now, that information is there for you without any writing on it for you to look at at your own, at your own pace. And here's some examples of transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. The heater will use infrared waves to transfer thermal energy from the heater through radiation, which is a pathway, to our hands, where we'll gain a store of thermal energy. This is the emitter. It emits heat. Emit just means to send out, to release. And this is the absorber. The torch with a store of chemical energy in a battery, will transfer through an electric circuit. So it'll be an electric transfer first into a lamp. And that lamp will then convert that electric transfer into radiation. That will hit our eyes and send a chemical signal. In fact, it'll be a, it'll be a, there'll be a thermal energy increase in our eyes a little bit but there'll also be a chemical energy increase in our eyes because of the actions of the nerves in the eye. So the torch is the emitter, the eyes are the, are the absorber. Radio transmitter. Now, radio transmitters are used using electrical energy, so there'll be an electrical transfer into our radio emitter. The radio emitter will convert that electrical transfer into a radiation transfer of radio waves before those electrical, before that radian, radiation transfer will be converted by the antenna, or the aerial and the radio. You cannot escape with the line. An electrical transfer in the radio will then be converted into sound waves coming out of the radio.
Visible light is the only part of the EM spectrum that we can see. Richard of York gave battle in vain. Roy G. Bibb, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. All of these different wavelengths, all these different colors, add up to make the light that we see every single day coming from the sun. There's a limited range of frequencies that can be detected by the human eye. And have a look at this. Red has got the longest wavelength. Cannot escape. Meaning it also has the lowest frequency. Violet, the shortest wavelength, meaning it has the highest frequency. Now in the future, instead of writing W for wavelength, I'm going to do the sheep daddy, as my year nines call it. Why do we call it sheep daddy? Because the Greek letter lamb, Da, this symbol here is a symbol for wavelength. So each color within the visible spectrum has its own narrow band of wavelength, lambda, sheep daddy, and frequency, f. Color filters work by absorbing certain wavelengths and therefore colors and transmitting other wavelengths. What does that mean, a color filter? Well, let's just say I put a screen here, and this screen only allows red light to transmit. All the other wavelengths would not be able to get through, which means only red light would be coming out the other side. We filter out, we get rid of all the other wavelengths by absorbing them. So this is absorbed, 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 and absorbed. And red light is transmitted. The color of an opaque object is determined by which wavelengths of light are more strongly reflected. So if I have yellow bouncing off my opaque object, then that object will appear yellow. If I have red bouncing off it, that object will appear red, blue, green, whatever. If there's a mix of filters, then we'll have a mix. Of, if there's a mix, pardon me, of reflected rays, we'll have a mix of colors. And if every wavelength is reflected equally, the object will appear white. So we have Roy G. Biv being reflected off of this square equally. If all the wavelengths of light are absorbed, absorbed equally, taken in equally, not allowed to go through equally, no Roy G. Biv bouncing off of this, thank you very much, it will appear black. But why does refraction happen using this idea of electromagnetic waves? Look at this little diagram. What you see there is a wave front. And the wave front is just that bit there, that line. It's a place where all of the rays, all the transverse rays that remember oscillate up and down, are oscillating in union. They're oscillating together. They are what we call in phase. The peaks line up with the peaks, the troughs line up with the troughs, and the peaks line up with the peaks. Now in this case, my drawing is not good, but it does give an idea of what in phase means. All of the peaks and the troughs are peaking and troughing at the same time. When we show the incident ray, as a wave front instead of just a line, we can see that the incident ray strikes the denser medium at an angle. Look here, this place right here. You can see that when the wave front hits the denser material, it slows down slightly, but it doesn't slow down all at once. You can see that little parts, little bits of that ray are slowing down before the rest. One side of the wave front hits before the other, so it slows down first. This causes the wave front to bend towards the normal line. Here's my normal. Here's my wave front. 
we can see that is bent towards the normal line. Wave fronts will be closer together as the velocity is decreased. If this is air, then my wave will be traveling at a certain velocity. Say this is glass, my wave will be traveling at a, a smaller velocity than it would through air because glass is more dense. There are more particles per meter cubed in glass than in air. Now, it's important to note that frequency is unchanged. Frequency stays the same, velocity decreases, and so wavelength decreases. You can see that. These rays here are much further apart than these rays here. And if we wanted to, we could count the amount of rays that pass this line in 10 seconds. Well, what happened there? Count the amount of rays that pass that line in 10 seconds. You'll get a number, call it A. Divide that by 10, and that will give you the frequency in hertz. Do the same here, and you'll have the same frequency. If you count the amount of rays passing this point, B, count the number of rays passing a point in 10 seconds, divide by 10, you'll get a certain amount of hertz. And I bet you all the money in my pocket versus all the money in your pocket that that will be the same. Now, electromagnetic waves aren't just fun. They're also slightly murderous. Beware. There are health risks, risks associated with high energy EM radiations. When we have a high frequency radiation, they have high energy transfers. This can be hazardous to human tissue. Remember, tissue is a collection of cells. Microwaves cause internal heating of body cells. Do not step into a microwave while it's on. That would be bad. Infrared can skin burns. Let's just put a little word in there. It can cause skin burns. Infrared is really good at transferring heat from point A to point B. Ultraviolet can, da can, can damage to surface cells, can cause damage to surface cells and eyes, leading to skin cancer and eye conditions. Because of the particular frequency and wavelength of ultraviolet, it can sometimes cause cancer, which is why we have to wear sun cream to avoid the UV light from the sun infecting our skin and giving us cancer. X-rays and gamma rays. These have got very low frequency. Oh, yeah, hang on. Very high frequency, high energy, and can cause mutation or damage to cells in the body, specifically the DNA. If you're asked about health risks, you can't just say something like, they hurt you. No marks. You must be specific about which ray does what to the body. Hazard from high energy radi radiations depends on the dose. If I flash the gamma ray at you for less than a microsecond, highly unlikely that you're going to get cancer. However, if I pointed one at you for a day, it is far more likely that you are going to get cancer because you have more of a dose of radiation. Radiation dose is a measure of the risk when exposed to these radiations, and it is measured in sieverts. Fun fact, one banana. Okay, I just wrote banana, but you know what I mean. One banana is equal to one micro sievert. One thousandth of a sievert. Here's the information without my scribblings, so you can read it. Here are the uses. The use of the electromagnetic wave depends on its frequency and its wavelength. We can use radio waves for TV, radio broadcasting, and satellite transmissions. Now, microwaves can be used for cooking in a microwave oven, but they're also used for communications and satellite transmissions. Mobile phones use microwaves to send messages up to space, to satellites, and then satellites send messages back to mobile phones. Infrared radiation can be used for cooking. You can get an infrared oven. 
thermal imaging. Um, those of you who play, um, it's a fishing game of some description. I don't know. You talk about it all the time, cod. But you have to use a thermal scope to find these fish. And I, I just don't understand why you would have to do that. Fish are cold-blooded anyway, so I don't know why. But thermal imaging means that we can pick up the infrared rays. Thanks, school, for interrupting my video. Yeah. Sorry about that, folks, but I'm not redoing this again. Thermal imaging, can, you, can, you can use special cameras that pick up the infrared radiation from hot things to see where they are. You can use infrared to send very short range communications. Very, very close. You used to be able to put two mobile phones together. They would touch and they would, they would be able to send infrared communications to each other. Optical fibers, like broadband, uh, uh, fiber optic broadband, TV controls, and security systems. We can't see infrared lights. Even if they're hitting you, we can't see them. So if I have a special camera that uses infrared light as like a little barrier, somebody tries to cross that barrier and my infrared light is broken, then it acts as a burglar alarm switch. What do we use visible light for? Well, vision, being able to see. Photography and illumination. That just means lighting up. UV can be used for security marking. So if anyone's ever put one of your banknotes underneath a UV light, a special ink absorbs the UV light and emits a light that we can see, a wavelength of light that we can see in response to that UV light hitting. Fluorescent lamps, detecting banknotes, and disinfecting water. In a lot of aquariums, you will have a pump um, connected to your tank where your little fishies are. There'll be a box up here full of UV light. Why? Why do it? No escape. That said UV, okay? UV, it said. And you pump the water through the UV light and back in again because UV has got enough energy because of its high frequency to actually kill microbes, bacteria, fungi, viruses inside that water. X-rays are used for observing the internal structure of objects like you or your bags at an airport. And gamma rays, they can sterilize food and medical equipment if I point a gamma ray at food or medical equipment for long enough, the high frequency, high energy gamma rays will kill any microorganisms that are on those materials. Gamma rays can also detect cancer and treat cancer. But remember, can also cause cancer if you have a high enough dose. Dose, not dose. Why did I say dose? Here it is without the words on it. Where do we get EM waves from? Well, this is an atom. You can draw on it just for fun. Where's my, there we go. This is the nucleus. And that is the electron. Changes within the nucleus of an atom can result in the emission of gamma waves. This occurs during radioactive decay of some unstable atoms. There is a video on radioactivity. Watch that video. Not there now, but it will be after I've done this one and maybe some other ones. So gamma rays can just come from the nucleus. That's the symbol for gamma. They're emitted from nuclei that have got lots of energy, so the nucleus can reduce the amount of energy it has. But... The electrons is where a lot of the electromagnetic radiation comes from. This is a low energy orbit. This is a high energy orbit. If an electron wants to be in the high energy orbit, it has to get more energy. We could put light, heat, electricity or X-rays pointed at this atom and it will give the electrons more energy. However, when that energy disappears, my electron is going to start using that, losing that energy. And when that energy is released from the electron, depending on which orbit it has come from, it will be a type of electromagnetic radiation. 
the EM radiation that can be released are X-rays, UV, light, infrared, microwave, or radio waves. The only one we don't get from there is gamma. Gamma comes from the nucleus. Atoms can receive energy from external sources. This energy can cause electrons to jump to a higher energy level. When the electron falls back to its original energy level, it will release the stored energy in the form of a photon of EM radiation. High energy level, low energy level. And here's some questions. Hit that pause button. Hit it again. I'm not responsible for any broken keyboards or mice. Mouses? Mice. Give it a go. And your answers. Put the put the pause. 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 Alrighty, that was that. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. See you next time. How do I stop? See you next time. I'll take stop.